We are joined today by my brilliant wife to discuss equity and the immorality of equity as a goal for any company. Uh, many of these companies that were pushing critical race theory, companies and institutions and uh, governmental agencies pushing critical race theory, have added equity into their diversity and inclusion departments now. So we have obviously been dealing with this very uh, uh, in depth for the last uh, four months, I guess now. And this started with my company at Sandia National Laboratory. We had uh, gone back and forth with them for a few months on some of the misinformation they had been pushing at the company. And I had gone to uh, ethics, government relations, the HR department, the, their diversity and inclusion team, as well as I was taken up to legal and went all the way top to the, to the top with the labs director. And they essentially came back to me after a couple months of that and told me to um, sit down, shut up and get back to work and keep my opinions to myself more or less. And then a class I had been uh, preparing to teach and I'd been preparing that class for, I guess a month, a month and a half or so. I had been preparing it to teach to correct the record on a lot of the misinformation Sandy had been giving. And I'd been working with my wife closely on that. So for the one hour of content that we saw in a video that I put out, August 25th, I mass emailed a video to all 16,000 employees and contractors at Sandia National Laboratories. And that was originally going to be a class. And for all the research that I, I did, probably 25% of the research um, that for not only that class, but all the other content that we didn't present there. And my wife did the other 75% and found out that she has a superpower for not only finding everything in the house when I can't find something, but also <laughs> finding a piece of information I need when researching. So I'd be looking for something for nearly an hour and being frustrated that I couldn't find it. And then five, 10 minutes later, she has it pulled up on her uh, on her laptop or cell phone or wherever re we're researching. So she's been absolutely uh, brilliant throughout this whole thing. And I could not have done it without her. So for every bit of effort that I did getting this uh, critical race theory out of our national laboratories and out of our federal facilities, and uh, with the memorandum and executive order from President Donald Trump and his administration uh, removing that from there, my wife has done every bit of, um, deserves credit for every bit of that effort and even more. So would you like to say a few words? Well, that might be a bit generous, but thank you. <laughs> well, when you came to me in June uh, with the letters that had been written to uh, the masses, I guess, about critical race theory and what they were pushing there, oh, I guess we just knew it was the right thing to do to push back and see if, if we couldn't correct the record and make a difference at the labs. And I think it came down to a moral imperative for us to push back because this is a um, federal facility that is uh, in, imperative to our national security. It's uh, absolutely critical, the work that we do at uh, Sandia National Laboratories and other national laboratories around the country. So for this type of critical race theory to perpetuate itself inside of these institutions, uh, it, w it is just a cancer on the institution and will destroy, it has been destroying team cohesion, will continue to destroy the institution itself, which that is absolutely not an option when it comes to our national laboratories. So it, we were absolutely obligated to do that. And so Again, I can't say enough good things about all, all that she's done behind the scenes to bring this fight forward and continue to communicate with the Department of Energy, uh, the Inspector General, and everybody else and help pass all this information along to them. So she's been doing a lion's share of the work on getting this out of our national laboratories. So let's talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity. And we are going to focus on the equity today. Diversity and, inclu diversity and inclusion are mostly a good thing. You can say that the, the majority of them is uh, a moral goal to have um, as long as it's not carried out through the lens of critical race theory. But equity is inherently immoral and evil because it focuses on outcomes and not on opportunities. And we've been discussing this for the past, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks at least, talking about equity being the real big problem here. And we didn't even know it at the time. In June, there was a program that uh, she dug up that was approved for Sandia where they were expanding from diversity and inclusion to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, the holy trinity uh, for critical race theory to address the original sin of slavery in the United States. So the equity portion of this is so immoral because... It always takes the form of power transfers. And we've been discussing this quite a bit. The power transfers 
are always, uh, whether it's in a governmental form or at a company, it's going to take the form of power tra transfer from the individual to some type of authority to enforce that equity. And so it's forced equal outcomes. Yeah, exactly. And if you're going to force those equal outcomes, you have to say, well, you as an individual, I can't just assess you as an individual. Mm -hmm. You have to give up some of your rights as an individual to this governing body that's going to assess it. If it's in hiring, they're going to look at you as an individual. And then they're going to have to assess all these other identitarian traits for you. They're going to assess your gender, your sex, your um, your sexual orientation. They your might assess status, your victim status as a veteran if you're disabled. All mm -hmm. these disadvantaged statuses that have been historically disadvantaged. And then that is a determining factor. They want equity. In order to get equity, you have to have some type of enforcement on the back end that looks like affirmative action. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so... You have to, if we look at this in the form of governments, uh, because this is obviously inherent in the definition of socialism or a subset of socialism is communism and a subset of communism is Marxism. And inherent in these forms of government is equity. There is a promise of equity inside of these, uh, in the definitions of these forms of government. There is no promise of equity in capitalism. Capitalism is uh, all about you as an individual, individualism, and our, our form of government that we currently have is a republic. You don't have any sort of promise of equity. But equity is always, at the end of the day, these forms of government, there's a reason why they always end in tyranny. Because in order to enforce this, you must, as an individual, cede such an insane amount of power to the authority that tyranny is inevitable every single time. Well, and, and I think you don't. So I guess it gets complicated because they don't, you don't really give that right to them, right? If you go apply for a job, they, they already took that power. They took it away from you. They seized it when they determined that they had enough power to just determine what equity is going to be and how they're going to assess yeah. it, their methodology in applying it, and then they already took that away from you. You didn't get to make the choice. And we talk about equity. Let's define this in the terms of our um, equity, how this comes into our institutions. Typically, it talks about equity in hiring. And they'll even, they even may present it to start with as equality of outcome. Mm -hmm. But that's not what it is, or else they would just call it equality or equality of outcome. Or sorry, equality of opportunity is what they'll present it as, not equality of outcome. Equality of opportunity. And they would just call it equality of opportunity or equality if that's what it was. But that's not what it is. It is specifically presented as equity because that is the end goal is equitable outcomes, forced equitable outcomes. Well, and they partner it with diversity and inclusion for a reason, right? Because diversity is, is so pivotal. They want diverse equity, which means to them, not diversity of thought, not diversity of skills or um, levels of, of success or, you know, it means race, it means gender, it means identity politics. They yeah, this is paired picture, with identitarianism. Yeah, the picture perfect diverse equity within a business. And you could you could apply equity to any any number of uh, measurements, equity and happiness, equity in your social interactions, equity in relationships, equity and outcome. If you're talking about outcomes, every outcome in uh, among all humans, especially across racial lines or gender lines are always going to be unequitable. That's just the nature of us having differences in our in our cultures. And we were speaking or I was speaking to James Lindsay um, messaging him back and forth and he was talking about equity and when he said this I thought it was like it's blatantly obviously after he says it but it, it struck me as very profound equity is inherently in in the definition of systemic racism because systemic racism at its core is the lack of equity or equitable outcomes and that's why you always have the affirming the consequence lot lo affirming the consequence logical fallacy used in pointing out systemic racism. They'll say this has an unequal outcome by the percentage of the population, by race, by the percentage of population benchmark. Therefore, it has to be racism. And affirming the consequences where you would say, you know, essentially, if there were systemic racism and white privilege, then obviously you would have disparate, disparate outcomes. And so we, therefore, if we see disparities in our outcomes, there must be systemic racism and white privilege which is uh, an insane jump in logic and reasoning, but that's the logic and reasoning they use continually. But it seemed profound to me because equity it, being inherent to that definition makes so much sense. It was always going to be part of these programs, these diversity and inclusion programs. The end goal of them was always to include that equity in there. 
And that is going to flow over into our form of government in the future if we allow this to invade our institutions. If you allow this in, uh, these equity programs in K through 12 education, in our, it's been in our universities for decades, if you allow it into our companies now, we know that politics is just downstream from culture. And when you are influencing the culture to that level, and we are now telling people that this is a moral goal, equity is a moral goal in so, any way, shape, or form, very quickly, we could, we go another decade or two down the road and people will all of a sudden are looking at our form of government and they say, there is no promise of equity in capitalism, in a republic. There's no equity promised anywhere inside of our form of government. And so what immediately happens is you start to look at these other forms of government, because if that's a moral goal, obviously that is, that is going to happen. You're going to look towards these other forms of government and say, well, socialism, they offer some equity, you know, Marxism, communism, we can, we can do it right. We can do it. We can be the first people in history to do socialism correctly. Well, you think about it. Okay. So you teach equity to kids. You teach critical race theory, critical theories and equity to children. And you teach them that it's better to be a victim because a victim gets a hand up or a victim gets, you know, all these, uh, equitable, like, so the, that picture of the the people with the fence and the crates, the tall yes. person gets a crate, the middle person gets a crate, and the small person gets a crate. They say that's equal opportunity, but then they say equity is the the shortest person, you know, gets three crates. Yeah. And so you look at it, and if you're teaching victimhood to children, you take away their motivation to get ahead. Like you you don't create your own opportunity. The system is supposed to create the opportunity for you. You know, it starts out equitably and there's been so many versions of that little graphic different graphics of trying to explain what equity is and the problem with it is in promise you talk about redistributing those those resources and things like that but your your promise does not match reality when we talk about times this has been implemented in any government what it takes the form of is you actually forcing the people on the top down to the level of the, the lowest among you because that is the e easiest way to make things equal is saying well if everyone can't have it then nobody can have it and we see this in the Soviet Union where you had, you know, between estimates range between 20 million to 100 million people that died and hundreds of millions of others have died under these forms of government. Because at the end of the day, if you are going to enforce equity, you have to cede that power from the individual to some type of government authority. It is going to take the form of tyranny every day of the week. Tyranny is inevitable. Well, that's where you get reparations, right? They, they want reparations for historically disadvantaged individuals. But even if you break that down further, you talk about historical disadvantage as by itself. We're talking about slavery, right? When they talk about historical yeah. disadvantage. But what about what about people who who have been historically generationally impoverished? What about people who have been, you know, historically who lived through that in, in the Soviet Union and then moved to America? They were historically disadvantaged. What about, you know, people in Africa now, modern modern disadvantage? disadvantagement or, or Muslims who, who well, as we know much, this there's equity so much disadvantage but then we're looking at it solely through a lens of race well it takes the form of uh, what we recognize as uh, historically disadvantaged groups in the United States so if you are part of one of these groups you can have for example you can have 13.5 percent um, african-american representation with half of those being female african-americans at your company and that is perfect equity in your company representation for hiring but then if you go past that and you have less representation of white individuals in that industry that's fine as well as long as you are at least meeting that standard um, that's the first goal meeting the standard of current representation and then um, James Lindsay points out in his most recent podcast on his um, YouTube channel which is new discourse mm -hmm. so look up his um, his podcast he just did on diversity inclusion and equity and he points out ruth bader ginsburg was interviewed and she said that was asked what would equity for females look like on representation of the supreme court and she said how many would you need on the supreme court and she said nine because not only do you have to meet that standard of representation you have to make up for your historic oppression and so reparations are also built into this idea of equity because what is true equity? We talk about equity if you just make it even today. That's not fair. Obviously, we need some sort of reparations for what's happened in the past. So your affirmative action doesn't just stop at the line of, okay, we've reached equal, we've reached equal representation. You have to go past there and continue these affirmative action programs in perpetuity 
Because if you don't, you're never going to make up for the original sin of slavery and Jim Crow and a historic oppression inside the United States. And obviously, you know, when you get to women, the oppression of women in the United States, which, again, nobody's disagreeing that the historic history of the United States among both women and minority communities is absolutely atrocious and evil. But you do not make up for past historic oppression with present oppression and discrimination. You don't, two wrongs don't make a right. Well, and what does that look like inside of our, our companies and our schools right now, specifically inside of your company? You know, they're, they're trying to discriminate against white males because of the historical disadvantage of minorities and women. And so you, you look at the demographics on their website about how many, pe how, how big is the percentage of, you know, diverse groups, minority groups yeah. within different jobs, <laughs> within the staffing, within the STEM, within this technical staff, you know, and you, you look inside each of these groups and like, what do they want it to look like? Why do they feel like they haven't achieved that? Why do they feel like they need to actively well, and they, discriminate against white men? And they don't define equity on purpose, right? Equity, equity is left as a very vague term because you ask them to define it and they're very squeamish about actually putting a hard definition to what equity is and what that looks like. Because that means forced discrimination, reparations. Exactly. And you say, just uh, take the example of our company here in New Mexico, Sandy National Laboratory Station in New Mexico. We say, what does equity look like? Mm -hmm. Let's say we're going to actually shoot for equity just in hiring. We're only going to focus on hiring. We're not going to focus on promotions. We're not going to focus on project allocation, money, funds, any of that. Just hiring. And so do we say, what are we representing equity in for African Americans and females? Are we, we'll just say African Americans, they make up 13.5% of the population nationally. Here locally, they make up 3.5% of the population. So which representation do we want? Are we going to represent the national? Are we going to reflect locally? In addition to that, um, are we reflecting them in every single job or just, just in general in the whole company? Because you talk about personal choices. African Americans are attending college at historically high rates, higher rates than ever before, which is absolutely fantastic. But even when they are choosing to go, go to college, they are choosing lower paying college majors. So even though they make up 13.5% of the population, they are only going into engineering at a rate of, I believe, 5 to 7% for choosing engineering jobs and even when they go into those jobs they choose the lowest paying jobs in those fields for example um females are choosing african-american females are choosing biology when they go into the uh, science field which is the lowest paying among those majors and african-american males when they go into engineering are choosing um, disproportionately choosing civil engineering the lowest paying among the d engineering disciplines mm -hmm. so now we get into it. Are we talking about equity? Because uh, if you want to say we need to reach equity, equitable representation in every single job within a company, you're obviously never going to achieve that. Like electrical engineers, you're never going to achieve the uh, equitable number of electrical engineers. And even among electrical engineers, you can break it down even further. There are disciplines. Are we talking about an analog electrical engineer, an RF electrical engineer? So it's ridiculous to say that uh, put equity as your goal because at the end of the day, you, at the end of the day, you are always going to cede power. You have to cede power from the individual and give that up to the company and allow them to discriminate against you based on your race. You're giving up that power saying, in hiring, you can discriminate against me. Now we want to do it in promotions. You have to allow, like, cede that power to them again for promotions. Cede that power again, again to them for project allocation. At the end of the day, it is always an immoral application to enforce equity. Well, and it gets, it gets very, very complicated, right? You're looking at quotas or, you know, different affirmative action programs. Or uh, so you look, you're looking at just black Americans and white Americans and, and those statistics, but then you break it down even further by gender. And how many of yeah. those black Americans need to be women in those fields? And how many white Americans, you know, need to be women in those fields? And then the LGBTQ community, how many of them need to be, you know, in that diverse group? Or, and then you, you look at American Indians, Native, you know, Pacific Islanders, Asians, you look at all yes. of these different groups and you have to break them about, down by percentage and of race and by gender. And, and you just, cause you want this pretty perfect picture yep. that's and perfectly equitable. It's, it's completely unachievable. And how do you, how, how do you achieve it? And your equal opportunity is extremely moral and easy goal to enforce. We, we can always point out, we always need to strive better when opportunities are not equal. When you look at the, um, 
government's main job, and this is also the job of your companies, is to remove roadblocks to you as the individual. If you find that you, there are roadblocks in your way to achieving your dreams, whether it be that you know the crime is too high in your neighborhood or whether there's some type of actual roadblock in your way to, uh, because of a regulation or whatever it may be that disproportionately affects you, is that it's, your, it's the government's job to eliminate those roadblocks and create equal opportunities for everybody. And that's very achievable and a very moral goal to have. Um, I like Brett Weinstein's quote he did in one of his podcasts, and I think this is uh, this is great applying it to critical race theory, and it's kind of a rallying cry for all those fighting against critical race theory and this kind of uh, equity push, this uh, this nonsense that they're pushing inside of our institutions. And he says that company or institutions that resist critical race theory are going to create a concentration of competence and courage, and we can extrapolate from his comments and say likewise. The companies who do not resist this push for, for critical race theory are going to create a concentration of incompetence and cowardice. And that is why it's so critical that, yes, that this fight is uh, it's been going on for a long time at a very low level. But the minute this got pushed into our most important institutions, that is the last place that we want to create a concentration of incompetence and cowardice. Those are the places that we most desire and most need to have this competence and this type of courage to do, not only do what's right, but the, the courage to stand up and create amazing things that save lives, to create these, uh, these tools that are used by our government and by our institutions to keep us safe as a country. Well, and that's, that's one thing that we just found out at your company, like they're actively going to lower the GPA requirements to get in to, to even apply. Well, you have to create equity and what, there's a barrier in the way of equity. And right now it's not coming to the f form factor of solely based on skin color. If this goes down the road any further, it will take that form. You, you, you're giving just a few extra points to individuals based on skin color or gender. But they're saying lowering the GPA requirements to create a more diverse workforce. Oh, they eliminate so, it as a measuring metric. So not lowering it, just eliminating it altogether, saying all, we're not going to consider it as a metric. And degrading <laughs> yes. to every minority. The and soft bigotry women. of low expectations right <laughs> there say, on full display. We're going to lower the standards for you because clearly you're incapable or, yeah. or what are they What are they saying? Just It's just insulting to start with. Yeah, and then we see, um, it was pointed out from one of our other videos, uh, we, we discussed uh, the self-selection of African immigrants coming over to the United States and how they do better than... Um, you know, native born African Americans inside of the United States. And it was pointed out to us that it was a, a self selecting group. And that's why they did better because they're more highly motivated. And I found we found that very funny because a lot of these individuals are coming over here more disadvantaged, starting out more disadvantaged than anyone currently living in the United States. They're showing up to a brand new country as adults. They do not even speak the language sometimes at all or very well. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand our culture, our systems, our government, any of that. They have a very limited understanding. And so they're starting way, way behind. And they very quickly catch up and surpass their um, black counterparts inside the United States because of their personal choices. And people say they're a self-selected group. No, they highlight the fact that personal choices are so critically important because for every bit of disadvantage you may say that one group has in the United States, it pales in comparison to these poor disadvantaged countries, people coming from them that don't even speak our language. You mm -hmm. cannot say they're even close to equivalent starting out, yet they surpass them because they are applying those you know, three simple rules of ensuring that they're placing education and family values at the forefront of their life and their personal choices, what drives them each and every day. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I, I've heard the argument too, that so ideologically American born, um, uh, black American born people have an ideology that's holding them back because of slavery. And you're like, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly right. Stop teaching them that they are oppressed. Stop teaching them this ideological belief that the system is out to get them because <laughs> It is not true. Yeah, they just change slavery. I just say victimhood in general. They have this ideology of victimhood. And yes, who's teaching them victimhood? Obviously, if you teach victimhood, you are going to dest destroy an individual, destroy their motivation for, for life, for their drive for exceed exceeding or excelling mm -hmm. in life. That is the quickest way you can actually destroy somebody is to give them a, a core a, a core value of victimhood in their life. And that's what this does in critical race theory. So it's kind of funny. They prove their own point 
saying it's because of this ideology of oppression that they have and you say well yes i completely agree with you that's why that's why and, they aren't striving and for... at the same time teaching them that equity should exist and that they deserve equity and that the system should give them equity which means they shouldn't have to try Yes, and you have you see this in the universities, right? And this is uh, obviously um, equity in admitting uh, your your rates of admittance to your university. They allow in a disproportionate amount of underqualified candidates that might be minorities, and then they're failing out at a higher rate. So I, I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop here, and for them to get very upset about the high drop high um, dropout rates and the number of people not passing. Because you can't just allow them in; you have to allow the same number of people to be graduating as well. So I imagine it's only a matter of time before you have uh, affirmative action inside of uh, these programs for GPA requirements. You're going to get kicking an extra point or two depending on what part of what disadvantaged group you're a part of, because you have to have these groups graduating at the same rate you can't just have them admitted at the same rate that's not equal opportunity you're, you're got to give them an equal opportunity in life meaning they have to actually graduate so it's just funny because no matter what at the end of the day you are seating equity takes the form of if you were going to force equal outcomes you have to cede power from the individual to some type of authority and they have to be able to enforce that and so at every single time this is tried, it is always immoral because at its core, you are giving up power from the individual to that central authority. Yeah. If you see equity creeping into your company or institution through these diversity and inclusion teams, you need to fight back against it with everything that you have. Equity is not a moral or just goal to have in any of these companies. And this can take the form of you fighting back, asking critical questions about what equity they're talking about, asking them to critically define it. But whatever you do, it is not okay for us to sit around and act like equity is moral or just in any way, shape, or form. If we do that, we know exactly what this, what this is going to do to not only our institutions and companies, but to our culture and country as a whole.